Okay, let's get started. I'm Jerry. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining us today for, for today's CNCF webinar. Uh, uh, the open source observ observability playbook. I'm Jerry Fallon and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenter today, Ken Peretz, Head of Solutions Engineering at Espiagon. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you were not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Hen to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Gary. Um, oh, guys, uh, you guys see my screen? Gary? Yep, we're all set. Cool. Um, so let me just, uh, do, just do a quick introduction about myself. I'm Ken Peretz. I'm running the solution engineering team in Epsagon. Uh, in Epsagon, we are building a, a monitoring solution for a modern application, whether it's on microservices or serverless. Everything that is basically distributed, um, our tool gives the ability to add um, pretty seamlessly uh, tracing and logging and also correlating between metrics. So uh, uh, what we call a full observability for those modern applications. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, Quite a few things. Uh, the first thing I want to do is just to do some sort of like a recap of what are the old school observability methods that are currently used, I'm guessing, by uh, a few of you uh, that are already here uh, in the crowd and um, how are you able to actually achieve observability um, easily. I'll also do some, some, some kind of uh, live demos. Hopefully nothing will actually blow up. Uh, it's been a while since I did that. and. Uh, uh, things that we're also going to touch is how open source uh, tools today give you the ability to implement some sort of like do-it-yourself observability and they have improved significantly throughout the years and um, I think there can be an excellent start for people that want to start off uh, just gaining some more uh, understanding of, uh, about how their system actually works. Um, but uh, first thing first, so let's just ask ourselves why do we even need monitoring um, it can be to, um, for various reasons, but I think the main one is just to make sure that our business works because if we're able to, if we have a website that is currently running and accepting, um, payments from customers or getting some, uh, uh, orders, uh, inside the, the website, if that website actually working properly, that means that our business is actually working properly. And if we think about what are the type of aspects we want to monitor, I think uh, uh, I read it on Google's SRA book. Uh, I'll share the links later. There are three golden signals that you want to get from your uh, system in order to be able to understand if it's working properly, if it's very healthy. And they are pretty uh, intuitive and logical to understand. The first one is latency, meaning that if your system um, has uh, suffering from a large latency, when it comes to requests, this means that it's uh, affecting your customers and they have a bad experience. Uh, around the traffic is how many people actually going into that website. And if that traffic is being uh, spiked or being low, it's something you want to monitor in order to be able to understand whether your system is healthy or not. Uh, the third thing is, it sounds pretty obvious, errors. You want to be able to understand how many errors you have in your system. Uh, this is something that is not that trivial when it comes to distributed systems. And not, it's not that easy to understand whether you have errors in your system. Um, and just being able to, to put that, uh, um, some sort of like a, a spotlight around the errors can be extremely useful. And the last thing is saturations, which means how many of my services are being highly, highly frequently accessed. If I have a database, for example, is that uh, some sort of my but, uh, bottleneck? If I'll be able to understand that and to see all my services and, and see which type of resources are being frequently used more than, than the other, then I'll be, be able to um, understand whether my system is healthy or not. Um, let's just talk a little bit about old school monitoring that is currently being done today. 
And um, I, I think this is probably the most popular uh, approach right now. So you have a system that is running. Usually, uh, in order to monitor that, you need to install an agent. So all the monitorings are pretty much um, agent-based. And the downside to that is that they only collect host data and they only collect metrics. And when that comes to a problem is that it doesn't give you the full understanding of what's going on within the services. You're able to see that uh, your payment service, for example, is under, um, let's say, a container. So you can see the CPU, you can see the metrics, but that doesn't really give you enough understanding whether uh, the database has been highly accessed or something inside your own business logic is actually causing the errors. And um, um, what we actually need in order to troubleshoot, we need some more debug data. So metrics are not enough. And this is like the first thing that we do that we try to go whenever any engineer uh, is getting a call and says that one of the services is acting out or something is, is acting a little fishy. The first thing you want to do is achieve much as and more as, uh, as debug data as you want. And we go directly to the logs in order to get that. And um, today logging uh, is in order to, to achieve logging, then uh, if you think about it, you have your uh, logs being written to the output, probably to some file in your containers or whether to, uh, you uh, remotely uh, move them to some other vendor. And they're being uh, basically dumped either locally or remotely. And an agent just collects those data and sends them whether to your own uh, uh, proprietary uh, Elasticsearch that you uh, uh, ran out on yourself, or maybe you actually push that to some log vendor to be able to handle high traffic. So everything is, is being done using agents that move logs from one place to another. And uh, if you go to what actually is being done today, so those, those methods of logging and monitoring can actually work pretty good if you have a monolithic application and you have only one system. But think about taking logs of different types of uh, services in your system and making sense. That's, that's where the hard part comes. And just um, um, if we think about it, like the change that software has been made in the years, I, you can see that trend in probably any graph that you will look up online. There's a huge trend of companies doing the huge shift from monolithic applications into uh, distributed systems. Um, Lambda adoption has been uh, highly, act uh, highly uh, ad Lambda has been highly adopted and also containerized. So a lot of companies did the switch to, cont to containers, which makes their, their system much, much, much and more highly distributed. And uh, that shift is not, uh, it makes a lot of sense because it's much more easier to develop. If I'm as a developer, I don't need to worry about the host that is running. I only need to worry about the business logic and I'm able to use as much as more um, third party APIs in order to query different types of, uh, uh, of data sources around the internet or if I want to implement some service, I can just use it instead of implementing that myself. That has significantly improved the, 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 the pace that we can actually develop. As a startup company, it's extremely useful to know you have those tools available online that you can just, if I want to implement payment, payment I can just use Stripe. Uh, if I want to run something and not worry about the host, I can just run it on a Lambda function and pay as I go. This allows me to move my business much, much more faster, but it also comes with a few uh, uh, downsides when it comes to actually understanding what's going on. So it sounds a little bit uh, shiny at the beginning, but once you run it into production, I'm pretty sure most of you uh, are familiar with that, it's becoming pretty hard to, to, to track those things down. And um, um, if I'll just continue talking about the challenges of engineers and DevOps uh, throughout that thing is that troubleshooting becomes extremely hard because you're not sure if just using those logs and the metrics is something that is, can be very efficient for highly distributed application. And if you look here on the right, we have a few, uh, each line represents a service and we see just uh, the one that is actually bolded is a communication throughout the services. And as an engineer, to be able to, to actually identify this trend throughout my system, I need to correlate between different types of logs. And that is something that is not possible using the uh, the basic logging uh, uh, capabilities. And if I can't really properly monitor my system, how can I actually develop new things? If I don't know what's going on on my production environment 
and I have uh, 20 services that are currently running and I know they're held in traffic and we have some sort of login that tells us whenever there's an exception, but I don't really know what's going on within that. And whenever there's a bug, it's gonna be extremely difficult for me to troubleshoot. As a developer, I'm losing my confidence when it comes to implementary services, simply because I don't really know how it's gonna affect uh, my production environment. Um, so this just leads me to what we call uh, the three pillars of observability. You probably saw it uh, around the web uh, called as MELT, which means we have metric, tracing, logging, and in events. And what it means is that in order to gain full observability on distributed systems, I need to be able to uh, take the metrics and take the traces and take the logs and combine them all together in order to give me a clue of what's going on end to end through my system. That, that is the only and efficient way to be able um, to not only know what's going on in production, but also to be able to see what's gonna happen once I gonna push new services through my development process. And when it comes to troubleshooting, it's gonna be extremely useful to, to have the, uh, all those uh, capabilities in hand. Um, now, I, I want to start off with first um, a lot of this uh, talk is going to be pretty technical and just showing you guys how we can take um, um, well, a, a Python application that is running on Flask, which is probably the most common framework today. And we're going to try out and see how we can implement login best practices. So hopefully you guys can actually leave this talk with, with something useful and, and something that you can actually try out uh, uh, on your own teams. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about logging. Logging is something that uh, I think this is the, the, the number one tool for engineers, non, number one debugging tools. And that just allows you to not only, um, not only display some appropriate information about your system, but also assist you whenever you want to debug something. You just print something to the screen. And now I just encourage you, I'm just going to list a few best practices and then we're going to run to uh, just a few uh, examples. For me, the, the top best practices for logging is, uh, first of all, print thing in a JSON. Print thing structured. And the reason I'm, I'm telling that, because if you're just gonna print some text that tells you uh, service A called the database, it's gonna be extremely hard for you to uh, push that and, and scale up with that and put that into a log aggregator that will actually make sense. And if you're gonna put it in a JSON structured data, you'll be able to uh, do things like index the fields that are actually part of that JSON, and later on to take those actually fields and run some aggregated uh, queries on that. For example, if you have a, a request coming to your system and you're printing a JSON that says this, this uh, request came from path uh, A, then you'll be able to go to your log aggregator, whether it's on Elastic or not, and once it's indexed, you can actually filter all the events that, that actually contain that without getting any false results if you're going to use something that is not structured. Uh, I'm going to, just going to share how it actually looks like. And uh, I think the most important thing is to actually automate that. Because uh, let's remember that everything that we print to the screen is stuff that we actually wrote in advance. So if we're looking to uh, improve our, um, let's say, our logging cap capabilities or observability capabilities, we must uh, be able to uh, not think all the time while we code what we actually gonna print. We need to have that process being fully automated because it will just be prone to errors. We don't want to, every time we write one, one line of code, then we write another logging code. This just also makes your code looks bad and also very hard to maintain because every change you do, you need to change also the prints and eventually it will, it's gonna start to have some inconsistency. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into the demo. Uh, we're gonna use Python and Flask, hopefully, it will work since I haven't done it for a while. Let me see here. So I clear this, clear this. So let me just actually jump to the code. Okay. So um, just gonna run here. Okay, so what actually we have here is the, um, uh, this is a Flask application. It's pretty straightforward, you import the Flask. And what you do with that is actually uh, uh, pretty neat because I am able to use um, the logger. Um, if you are familiar with, uh, this is just an example for Python, but if you're familiar with the login tracing library, you're also able to 
override the, the default formatter, which means that every time I print to the screen, uh, even if it's a warning or anything like that, it will put it in a structured manner, meaning that I don't need to no longer print. If, if I talked about like how to put things in a structured thing, you can do that, you can actually automate that. So everything you print on the screen, even existing logs that you currently have in your code, if you only change and add a, an additional class called the structure log, then we'll be able to uh, uh, automatically change the way it prints to the screen. And what we have here is just a simple hello that is accepting anything coming from the, the default website. And it's just printing a, a warning that a user got in and is uh, uh, in endpoint, uh, whatever. Now, um, actually, I think this is gonna work better like this. Yeah, I'm probably breaking the code now, but uh, I just wanna show you how easy it is to actually implement that kind of thing. Um, I'm just doing some minor change because I just noticed that this print doesn't really print anything. Okay. I'm hoping I'm on Python 3. Okay, so let me just run it the structure logging. Great. So now we're just gonna curl it. Perfect. So I just ran a request to my Flask application, it's been running, and now we can see the structured log. So you can see the log here is pretty structured. I can put it in Elastic and easily index that. And this means that every time there's a request, I can make sure that it's, I know the service name, I know the stage, whether it's production or not, I know the level, I know the message. And now if you want to know how many errors I had in production uh, from that service, you can just filter by service and stage and the type of level message, which is something pretty, pretty useful. It's not just printing something to the screen that will be uh, later on pretty hard to, um, to follow. And um, moving to the next thing is actually monitoring best practices. So logs, uh, we already agree that logs are not enough. And if you want to actually monitor things even better, uh, we want to be able to um, make sure that all our metrics are being aggregated into a unified dashboard. Um, and what do I mean by that is, is that I, I need to have a single dashboard where I can view all of the resources in my services, whether if I'm uh, currently monitoring my database or monitoring my Flask application or monitoring anything else that comes in mind. I don't want to switch between screens because every time there's going to be an issue, I'm going to have to say, okay, where do we monitor uh, our database? And if I want to actually take those things and put out alerts, it's gonna be extremely hard to maintain once you have different types of dashboards. So if you're choosing in one dashboard, just go with that and make sure that all the metrics are being pushed to that dashboard. And the second thing is define the critical metrics that you have. Uh, you don't want to be alerted uh, up uh, like late at night on anything that actually breaks in your system. You want to define the critical metrics that you say that in that point, it's uh, something that you have to uh, to fix, meaning that if my database is a little bit loaded, I don't wanna get any, any alerts, but whenever the database reaches it, it's like the no return point, when it's ever, it's gonna be stuck and not gonna be available for my customers, then that's the threshold I want to be um, pointing at. And the third thing is that don't think about metrics as only as infrastructure metrics. Think about metrics as uh, things that can help your business. So make sure you use custom business metrics. And if I take the example of a website that is currently um, I don't know, shipping things to, uh, to customers and have some orders in line, if I have a dashboard that tells me that this month or this week or the last few days, we got 20, um, uh, 20 uh, orders or, or 10 orders or something about that, I can also understand like what is the business state and what is the business self. And it's something that is pretty cool to share with everyone that are not specifically engineers in my system, can be shared by the sales engineer, they can also use those, those dashboards. And I also highly encourage to take all those groups in your system and, and put them in the same dashboard. Obviously give each one of them their own view, but everything needs to be in the same place. It will be the much more useful and efficient for your company. And, um, and if we think about like what we want to monitor on an application level, then Every call, for example, that we are doing to some API, we want to see what is the average duration. Uh, if we have a, uh, if we push messages on a queue, we want to see what is the um, minimum number that is currently being accessed to that queue. It's, it's just making sure that 
uh, you know which type of resource in your system is prone to errors. Because if I'm gonna have a, a queue that is currently handling my, my, all my deliveries, if it's gonna uh, break, for example, then I will also be alerted on that. But I also want to be aware whenever there is a business issue. For example, if that message queue is reaching like no orders at all in the last hour, and, uh, and, and typically something that is not happening, then I also want to put on uh, actual things on that. And there's a lot of things that you can go through, like the HTTP code that you want to actually monitor. But I think the most um, important thing when it comes to those metrics is to be able to uh, have your, uh, your services trigger those metrics and print, for example, the, the, the structured log that we saw and do that automatically, which is something that I'm just uh, also going to jump and show now. Um, so we are talking about the monitoring best practices. And wait, the screen is here. So I'm just gonna jump to this example uh, of actually using, uh, I'm, I'm using Flask in this example, so I'm gonna continue that and show how we can, uh, if you said we want to measure every request coming to my server and, and know what is the average duration, I need to be able to calculate that. And uh, my first best practice tip was to not do things manually. So we're gonna use what's called a middleware in Flask. It's just the ability to, every time there's a request coming in to Flask, you can use the middleware, which will basically, you can uh, hook into different types of uh, um, times in your, in your system. For example, if a request just come, you can hook on, on the before request and do some operation, and also in the after request, and also do some operation. And um, uh, uh, as you see, the, the, the Flask application is pretty standard, just something that returns us hello world. All the thing that is pretty juicy is coming here in the middleware. So we have the the middleware that is actually hooking to the before request and after request with those two functions. And what we do is that we first, whenever the request comes, we time it, we take the current time. And the second thing we do is that we print to the screen what was the duration uh, with also some additional information. And let's see how that uh, actually looks like. It's called APM. So our Flask application is currently running. We're gonna send another message. Awesome. So now what I can see is that not only, um, and if I'll just go back to the code, we also still using the structured log that we saw. And that structured log gets a, um, a record to print and it also makes sure if you're printing in uh, something under message, it also makes sure to add that as an additional information. So all the file name, the service, the stage that we saw before is still keeping the same, um, the same structure. So it can be also extremely useful for uh, indexing that later on. And if I'll go back to the example, so we run it and now we saw the level, the level is warning. Uh, this is the, the stage in production. And the, thing, the new thing that we just added is that how much time it actually took. So I can see uh, the duration was around nine, um, I think it's nine milliseconds um, here, and the status code was 200. So, if I'm uh, the, the fact that it's so uh, JSON, I can actually parse it in, in any, in, especially in, in Elastic on any anything that supports uh, log aggregation. So I can actually filter out all the requests or do aggregation, like how many requests were 200, how many 500, and set that as my metric or even duration. If this API is going to take more than 30 seconds, then I want to be alerted because. AWS API gateway uh, timeouts on, on that point. Now, we have, it, it's, it's pretty nice what we did so far, but there's a lot of things that we, that we know that's missing. It's pretty nice if you have a, an application that is currently running and it's something that, uh, that works on a very low scale. But if we think about a very distributed system, we need to be able to correlate those metrics and logs. We need to be able to uh, take uh, different services in our system and make sure we correlate between that. And this just leads me to um, explaining about distributed tracing. Um, I'm sure you guys heard about this, uh, probably uh, a lot of you actually practicing that and, and using that in your teams. I'm just gonna show if you uh, kind of do it yourself, distributed tracing and how to use open source tools to, to be able to implement that. And it's, uh, like I said, open source tools today did a huge improvement uh, when it comes to that. So it's, it can be pretty easy to do that. And I'll also show that uh, uh, in a few. Now, before that, let's just track back and understand why do we even need 
and why is uh, distributed tracing? So a uh, distributed tracing is basically, a trace is basically storytelling. It means that I can uh, tell what actually happened in my system. For example, a client uh, went to my website and uh, pushed an order and that trigger a service that is talking with a database and that database uh, put a message on a queue and that queue inject another thing and then I returned uh, uh, and then I sent an email to my customer. So I'm closing a full loop of asynchronous events, but they're all initiated from the same position. So to be able to draw that um, and to be able to, to, to understand how it goes, this is how distributed tracing actually uh, help us. It's just the ability to, to, to understand uh, what happening from end to end in my system. And doing that yourself, um, it is easy, but it requires a lot of maintenance. And if we're talking about uh, small companies that it might, it might work, but if we think about scaling up, uh, this means that your entire uh, engineering team needs to be aware of that and needs to do that. Uh, I think like only very, very tech savvy companies like Uber or companies like that allow themselves to have uh, full teams dedicated to uh, code ob observability and share those tools along the other teams. And, um, uh, the, the truth is that today, uh, when, when a company just started, it's pretty hard to do that yourself. And it doesn't even make sense to do that yourself because you, you are, uh, want to focus on your business. You want to be able to deliver products to your customers rather than have a, a niche a team that will do solely observability. Um, and if I'll just talk about the, what we have today in terms of like the, the landscape of tools that allow you to do distributed tracing. So, uh, part of the CNCF, we have open tracing and open census that now joined into open telemetry and also Jaeger and Zipkin that will allow you to not only generate traces, but also uh, the tools to ingest them and visualize them. Um, when it comes to open telemetry, that's the term of the, the standard and the list of libraries that will allow you to do some sort of like automated uh, instrumentation. I, um, if, if you guys are not familiar with that, I, I strongly advise you to to try them out, uh, they're pretty easy to set up and we're just gonna do that uh, in the example very soon. Now, if I'm talking about how to actually do that, so generate traces is something that um, um, if you use, for in this example, we're gonna use open tracing and in order to generate traces, we need to understand what do we want to have inside that traces. So a trace means that every time my service run, like we saw, the request going from um, in my flask. So if we'll just track back here, I can see that the request here, once it runs, it just printed a, a, a message up to the log. And for me, this message can be, uh, that's what I call a trace. A trace is just a log print that tells me what this application did, who it talked to, which resources it actually used, and how much time it actually happened, whether there are exceptions or not, just some, um, raw information about what this operation actually did. And open tracing is just basically a standard that allow you to, uh, to, to code um, and create those kind of traces. Uh, in, in their lingo, it's called a span. And the first thing you want to do is to be able to uh, instrument every call you have. So if I'm talking, uh, if I'm having a flask request that is also accessing my AWS SDK and putting a message on S3 or putting a message on an SQS or calling a third-party API or even calling my Postgres database, I want to be able to automatically trace those without the need to manually creating those spans. And um, this means that every request and response I have, I'm gonna create a span. And I also want to, for that span to add some context, meaning that if I'm calling a database, it's not enough for me to understand how much time it took. I also want to understand which table, which query, um, and some more additional information that can help me later on debug. And uh, I, the most important thing when it comes to creating spans is to be able to not only think about a, a span as part of a, a single service, thinking about in the scope of a end-to-end, -end. like we, like I talked before that a request can go and put a message on, an, uh, on, a, on a message queue that will later on asynchronically trigger another service. So those two services need to pass um, correlation IDs and tell each other that they are part of the same distributed trace. And this is the ability of actually injecting and extracting identifiers. And I'll show that uh, right now in the example.
I'm sorry, I'll say if I'm going too fast, um, but uh, you can just later on watch it and put me on um, half the speed. That's what usually people do. Um, okay, so let me just jump into the tracing. So I'm using Open Tracing library, uh, uh, and I'm just using their tracer and their format here. And if we, if we remember the Flask middleware with it, but yeah, before that actually put the before request and after request, uh, this, is our, this is my Flask application. It's still the same hello world. It doesn't do anything fancy, but the middleware here is now creating spans. So uh, I want before the request actually happens, I want to extract um, uh, from the uh, HTTP headers of the Flask, I want to extract the identifier and this, this actually uh, just give me the, the actual span context. So I, I want to be able to, whenever a request comes, to take all the information that I can take. And this will be my context, meaning I can see the headers, I can see some additional information. And I can also uh, use that context to, um, to create a new span. And in, if this, in this example, if for, if for example, someone called my, uh, my Flask application and, and that service was also traced, in the headers, there will be a correlation ID that will tell me, hey, you belong to this distributed trace, and now I can continue it. And every, every time you create a span, it's either you're continuing an, a distributed trace or you're just creating a new one. So here we're just going to create one or, or be a continuation of another one. Now we also want to add some context and additional context, like what is the URL and which user actually requested that. So I can later on filter by that user or filter by that URL that will allow me to understand uh, thing much more uh, powerfully. And I also want that after the request to be able to display the status code and the duration that it actually took. So let's see how it actually looks like. Yeah, just have to install up and tracing. Good. Yeah, so now we have the capture span and everything that is printed, uh, I'm just printing the actual uh, uh, span. It doesn't have anything very structured in terms of, of, of printing that, but the span itself is, can, is, sent, is being sent to the uh, Jager that we can later on show how it actually looks like. Now, we have the traces. So that service, that Flex application created a span and that span is being ingested. So I can use Jager, for example, which can be pretty useful for ingesting traces. And it can handle any scale that you want. It all depends on where you actually run it. And it also allows you to do some searches around that and also, and also uh, do some visualization. So um, there's also other tools that will allow you to set up alerts, meaning that every time there is a span that contains an exception, then you want to be alerted on. And uh, a, a good example for that is Jager, that uh, this, is a, this is exactly how it looks like. So it gives you a timeline view of all the operation that happened. If you think about it, you have your Flask application that is stuck into the database. So you can see all the operation. It's pretty useful to uh, optimize. So if you know that you have a flow, uh, kind of flow in your system that is currently handling orders, like um, the example that I'm using through, throughout this talk, you can understand how much time is being invested in that, uh, in, each, in each part of your system. And um, the, the most thing important about creating spans is adding and, and tagging them and adding some context for you to be able not only, um, not only understand when you, once you troubleshoot like identifiers, you can see the user ID, the customer ID, the device ID, but you can also see things like that are relevant to your flow control. You can see the, um, what type of event is actually happening, things that are related to your business logic. And you can also add business metrics uh, in each span. You can say how many items I currently have in the cart, how many minutes um, uh, are actually being watched in my uh, video uh, 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 offering or anything uh, of that sort. So adding context into spans can be extremely useful, not only for troubleshooting, but also for later on searching and filtering and then creating metrics around that. So I can create a metric that will tell me how many items I have in my, in my cart in a trend of every day throughout the week. So that can be a, uh, a dashboard that I can actually use and set up alerts whenever it's reaching a threshold, whether it's minimum or not, or not, or whether there's a spike. So I'll know that I need to whether make sure that my database can handle the load if it's gonna continue in the same trend. Uh, the other thing that can be extremely useful and, and life-saving uh, for a business 
uh, the, the next thing that, that is super important to add to a span is, I'm saying just like, let's not stop there. Let's not only add the thing that we think we need, let's just add anything. For example, if I'm calling a database, I don't only need to say what uh, type of table or how many, uh, what's the length of the query or what is the result. I want to see the entire query through that SQL or NoSQL database because I can use that query to see what is my most frequently uh, query to that database. I can do optimizations around the database. I can see which one, which, what exactly was the query that ran that caused that error because getting a notification that my database, database failed is not enough for me to troubleshoot. I want to understand exactly uh, what happened. And um, let's say, for example, I'm querying now uh, uh, Stripe for payment. It's not enough for me to understand that I got 500 or to understand that um, um, something actually broke. I want to see the actual payload because uh, any third party tool that you use, not only that they tell you that something went wrong, they also give you a very informative information about what actually went wrong. And if you think about the time that this actually will save you is that uh, if for example, something actually broke and you know you have 500 and you see and you know the exact service, you know the customer that, that it happened, you know everything, but now you're trying to understand what actually happened. So the engineer will go to your dev environment and will try to you know, reproduce it. And reproducing takes time, it's not accurate. And if you're in advance already printing all the information that you need, then you'll be able to um, troubleshoot it uh, on the exact events that happened. So you can see the exact event that happened with all the um, relevant information. Now, this just leads me to a mindset that uh, I think you guys should, should actually use is that using tracing, not just as a part of the, uh, uh, the logging of the metrics uh, pillars, but just as a, as a glue between those. So I can use, I can go from traces to the exact log. I can print exactly where the logs resides through the trace that I print. I can uh, uh, print things like what is the container ID, uh, whether it's running a Lambda, what type of, uh, what's the Lambda function. I can, get, can easily correlate between, or even print the request ID of that Lambda function. Then I can easily correlate between the trace to the environment and also vice versa. I can go to the environment and to that invocation and, and search that uh, request ID throughout my log aggregator and then I will find the exact traces that happen. And that is possible because I'm gonna use the structured and automated logs. So I don't need to worry that my team actually does that. Um, so um, we're just gonna come uh, very closely to the ending. I'm just gonna talk very briefly about what's for me the best practices to gain full observability to the system. And when it comes to that, uh, I think teams just need to have things automated for them. You don't want your uh, engineers focusing on doing uh, by yourself, creating spans, uh, printing things to the logs, even thinking about that. You want to have a tool that you just plug in and make sure that everything is already automatically captured. You don't need to even maintain it because uh, if you need to make the decision whether uh, you're gonna focus on fixing your delivery system or fixing your uh, logging library, you're always gonna choose the delivery system and then it's gonna be extremely hard for you to track back and actually do it. So you're gonna have some legacy observability code that is pretty hard to maintain. And I don't think, uh, especially for small startups or even huge enterprises, it's not something that you want your team to actually focus. So you need to think about just exactly as I will not implement my own payment system and I will use a third party like, like other tools that, that are currently available. I don't want to also implement observability into my team because there's companies that exactly do that. Uh, side note, Epsagon, but I'm, I'm saying that as an engineer that this is something that we also uh, encourage in our own company. We, use, uh, we also use uh, uh, Epsagon to, to monitor our own Epsagon environment. And this means that our engineers can focus on actually building the system and not worrying on monitoring that. And you want to, to have that observability tool to support any environment. So if you're gonna switch between serverless to Kubernetes, ECS, AKS, Azure, GCP, or anything on-premise, on you don't want to worry about that, that you need to change the way your code uh, operates. You want to be able to have a, a, a tracing library or a tracing tool that will work on any environment because companies often do the change, do the, do the shift, and the first thing they are cared about 
how we will be able to monitor if you're going to move to Azure or things like that. So you need to eliminate that from your, uh, your, your thought because you can use a tool that will support any environment. And you want to be able to connect every request that goes in, in a transaction. For example, if you have a Lambda function that is currently uh, putting a, a message on a database that is uh, triggering another Lambda function that is talking with your, one of your containers or one of your legacy services, you want to be able to connect all of those together in a transaction and then to have the ability to take that data and actually search and analyze that so you can gain uh, business related metrics and also to be able to search very quickly and troubleshoot that. And that alone will just help you to you just quickly pinpoint those problems. Um, so just to summarize, um, modern application today are, are very distributed. They are using a lot of upstack, up, upstack layers. You don't need to worry about servers. You don't need to worry. If I'm talking about Kubernetes, you don't need to worry about creating those containers. Everything is being managed automatically and everything is being abstracted from you because you want to focus on your business logic. And in order to monitor that, it's not the standard monitoring and log that will assist you. You need to use something much more advanced that will also uh, inherently implement distributed tracing within. And um, this is exactly why distributed tracing becomes much more crucial uh, component in, in, in any environment. And just as a side note for me, I encourage you guys to, uh, obviously if you're running a small company and you wanna try out those things, those, those open source tools are uh, definitely available and they are pretty, pretty good. But if I'm thinking about scale and production, um, don't implement something that unless you actually need it. If you want to be professional in payment, then yeah, then implement your own payment system. But if you are only want to use that as a tool, then you need to choose like what is the best tool for you to use. And obviously you don't want to have your engineering team focused on creating uh, stuff like that. So um, that's it for me. So now is the Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you, Hen, for a wonderful presentation. We now have some time for some questions. Um, I believe we already have one here in the Q&A box. In quote, support any environment, would you be able to provide an example of a tool that is limited to a set of environments? A tool that is limited to a set of environments? Yeah, provide an example of a tool that is limited to a set of environments. Yeah, so if you think about being able to create your, uh, your own, uh, if I'll take like Jager as a service, for example, that you can run on your own uh, environment, if you're gonna do the switch to another environment, then you're gonna have to also copy that uh, to another tool, to, to another environment. 